Uh, thank you, Barney, for those really kind words uh, and for inviting me to join you here today. Uh, I'm personally grateful, and the Department of Justice is incredibly fortunate for the stewardship that both you and Mary Lou provide over this con incredibly critical constituency and this important set of issues. I applaud your consistency. I applaud, applaud your diligent support for law enforcement and the resources that you have made available from grant programs <clears throat> and technical assistance to education publications and informational forums evidences your commitment to offering dynamic and effective leadership in the field of policing. As important as your role, the more important role and the one I want to thank more is for all of you, all of you who are attending today. Public safety is a collaborative effort, and the topics discussed here center around issues that have brought the Justice Department and have brought information to the Justice Department from people like you. We organized this conference to address the issues that you bring here, to address the concerns that you see out in the field, that you experience day to day. And it's a way for us to collaborate together to determine next steps and to bring about the necessary changes in policing and crime fighting that are needed. One of our main objectives at the Department of Justice is collaboration. You're going to hear a great deal of discussion over the next two days about partnerships. And today, I'd like to talk to you specifically about effective ways that we can work together to address crime. As chiefs and sheriffs, officers and deputies, educators and researchers, you see firsthand the devastating impact that crime can have not only on those who have been personally victimized, but also on their families and the communities that surround them. I know that you also see firsthand the dreams that can be lost by a child when her parent chooses a life of crime, or by a young person who decides to turn to crime, or by a former offender who makes the wrong choices, breaks the law, and returns to prison. We realize that the protection of our communities in so many ways falls directly on your shoulders, but you're not in this alone. If there is one idea that you walk away from this conference with, I hope it will be that we at the Justice Department are your partners in this effort. Together, we will continue to make a comprehensive and a collaborative approach to finding the solutions that are the most effective in your communities. And in this budget climate, we are keenly aware of the need to make sure that we're coordinating our efforts and make sure that we make public safety dollars go even further. This coordinated approach to finding solutions involves more than just enforcement. We must also direct our efforts towards the prevention of the occurrence of crime in the first place, provide support through intervention programs, and provide individuals who are re-entering our communities from jails and prisons with the tools they need to successfully turn away from crime. By balancing these four legs of the stool, enforcement, prevention, intervention, and re-entry, together we can attain our shared goal of finding cost-effective ways to make our communities safer. Community, community policing is and has always been an integral part of that strategy. Community policing focuses on problem solving and partnering with the community to address all aspects of threats against public safety. This approach gets community stakeholders involved in the work of fighting crime. It builds trust between officers and local residents and ultimately, it improves public confidence in law enforcement effectiveness and in the integrity of the criminal justice system as a whole. And this is more than just a concept. This is law enforcement infrastructure that serves over 80% of the nation's public. Over the past three years, funding through the COPS office has added over 7,000 officers to the field. Barney mentioned a little bit earlier that just a few weeks ago, the COPS office delivered an additional $111 million to hire new officers 
and protect law enforcement jobs that are in jeopardy. Money talks, and this is a significant statement about the department's priorities given the current fiscal climate. This is money well spent. We are particularly proud, again as, Mar as Barney mentioned, that 600 military veterans will be funded through this investment. And it's an important step towards the President's goal of opening up more opportunities for our veterans. Law enforcement is an honored profession that demands many of the same attributes as military service. Character, personal bravery, and a deep commitment to public service. By adding more veterans to our police departments, we not only look over and look after those who have put their lives on the line to protect us all, but we enhance those shared valiant qualities in the delivery of community policing around the country. In addition, funding through the COPS hiring program will be used to save nearly 200 jobs this year alone that are in jeopardy of being cut due to budget issues in the state and local environments. The dramatic impact that our economy has had on local policing has been discussed at length. Too many local departments are still dealing with budget shortfalls that are resulting in changes to the services they're able to deliver. And we are making every effort, department-wide, to continue to find ways to assist you in this challenge. And frankly, we're fortunate in one aspect, and that is that this is one of the few areas of bipartisan support that we can find these days. Recent appropriations activity in the House highlights the bipartisan appreciation for the COPS hiring program. In the House, they've proposed nearly $200 million for COPS for 2013. In the Senate, over $250 million has been proposed, and the administration has proposed approximately $300 million. Somewhere in that range, we're going to find a good amount of money to keep pushing the COPS program forward and to push these positions into a place where we can have more robust hiring next year. Now, in addition to the commitment to community policing strategies and providing much needed resources for officers and the training, the department recognizes that more must be done to ensure crime prevention. I'd like to briefly discuss three of our efforts, one focused on youth violence, another on better serving innocent children found on crime scenes, and finally, our commitment to reducing recidivism in state, local, and federal areas. The National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention launched two years ago at the direction of President Obama brings together a network of communities, federal agencies like the Departments of Justice and Education, corporate partners and nonprofit groups, along with neighborhood and faith-based organizations and youth representatives. They come together to share information and to build local capacity to prevent and reduce youth violence. These efforts and these federal agencies maximize and leverage the existing resources that we have by sharing what works between federal, state, and local partners. The forum creates a national conversation about youth and gang violence by increasing the awareness and building the local capacity to more effectively address these issues. We are creating a new model, a model where federal and local collaboration exists encouraging partners on all sides to change the way we do business and share common challenges and promising strategies, all leading to one thing, coordinated action. The forum is active currently in Boston, Chicago, Detroit, Memphis, Salinas, and San Jose with plans to expand in more cities. And it also contemplates and will involve the Attorney General's Defending Childhood Initiative, which is a Department of Justice-wide effort designed to prevent and reduce the harm caused by children's exposure to violence. The Attorney General also announced the launch of an online toolkit to complement this, and it's now available to the public. It provides resources on how to gather and better use it, utilize the data on youth violence, identify community assets that can be brought to bear on the problem, develop measurable objectives, and create and implement your own plans. We're also committed to better identifying and serving a vulnerable group who we refer to as drug-endangered children. In response to the administration's 2010 National Drug Control Strategy, 
the department established the Federal Interagency Task Force on Drug Endangered Children. We call it DEC. I'm privileged to chair this important task force, which benefits from active participation from multiple components within the Department of Justice, as well as the Office of National Drug Policy and the U.S. Departments of Health and Human Services, Education, Homeland Security, and Transportation. The DEC Task Force is committed to identifying ways to better serve and protect drug-endangered children by building partnerships on federal, state, and tribal and local levels. Why are we doing this? Why is this constituency a priority for us? Over 9 million children, almost 13 percent of the child population in this country, live in households where a parent or another adult uses, manufactures, or distributes illicit drugs. In 81 percent of the reported cases of child abuse and neglect, substance abuse is rated as either the worst or the second worst problem in the home. And a sad fact of which you are all probably aware, drug-endangered children are almost 60 percent more likely to be arrested as juveniles. This is a prime opportunity for prevention. Early intervention with these kids is not only the right thing to do, but it's one of our best hopes of stopping the cycle of crime. The COPS office has been a key partner in our effort to better identify and serve drug-endangered children. Funding through COPS has supported the development of a core DEC curriculum and enabled thousands of state, local, and tribal law enforcement personnel to receive DEC training. Last year, in coordination with the members of the DEC task force, COPS developed a resources CD for professionals, bringing together all the tools that have been created and identified into one easy-to-use free toolkit. It includes first responder checklists and other valuable tools to better identify and serve these kids. In addition to identifying and preventing crime by assisting youth violence and youth who are exposed to violent crime, we know it's also critical to reduce recidivism. A truly productive conversation regarding the evolution of policing has to include prisoner reentry and practices that reduce the number of prisoners who enter and reenter the criminal justice system. We need to hold accountable those who commit crimes, especially violent offenders and those who offend repeatedly. And we need to hold them responsible through either incarceration or some other effective sanction. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that time spent behind bars adversely affects so many aspects of a former prisoner's life, from employment and education to housing opportunities. These things influence a person's chances of transitioning back into our communities and becoming a productive, law-abiding citizen and remaining free from crime and becoming, as a matter of fact, a taxpayer who will contribute to our revenue base. It also impacts their families and their communities who are depending on them to become law-abiding and productive citizens. Providing former offenders with the skills and the resources that they need to successfully re-enter society is absolutely critical if we have any hope of preventing former offenders from again engaging in criminal conduct that only harms victims and harms the communities around them. And part of community policing is helping to make sure that these former offenders get the help and the support that they need to become productive members of the community rather than a danger to the community. Today, some 2.3 million people, more than one in 100 adults, are behind bars in the United States. At some point, 95 percent of these prisoners will be released, meaning some 700,000 people are coming out of our state and federal prisons every year. We know that two-thirds of all of the released state prisoners will be rearrested within three years, and half of them will return to prison. On the federal side, 40 percent are rearrested and have their supervision revoked within three years. Aside from the very serious implications on public safety, recidivism impacts the budgets at the state, federal, and local levels. Our Bureau of Justice Statistics estimates that more than 74 billion dollars with a B is spent on state, 
federal and local corrections annually. In fact, it's one of the most expensive items on any state budget today. And with more than $6.5 billion spent on the Bureau of Prisons and the federal system each year, it takes up too big a portion of the Justice Department's budgets. These numbers demonstrate that our focus on reentry is critical not only to address issues of public safety, but also to address issues of economic and budget safety. We have a lot to be proud of in light of all of our successful efforts to prevent and respond to crime in our communities. The examples I briefly touched on today demonstrate the effectiveness of the partnerships between the many organizations you represent and the Department of Justice in protecting people from crime. We need to be innovative. We need to be cost effective if we are going to do the important job of protecting victims of crime and making our communities safer. In light of our tough budgets and our limited resources, we need to find ways to do these things smarter. And that means finding ways to do them together. We've made a lot of progress, but we still have our work cut out for us. And as I look out among you, I know that this is a challenge we can take on and we can win. Through working together, we can make our communities safer in every way that matters. I want to thank you all for what you do every day to make our communities safer, for the essential role you play in each of your communities, and for your support and your partnership with the Department of Justice. Have a great conference, and thank you all for what you do.